Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back at the, here at the end of the week for another weekly market recap featuring my good friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. Lance, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm glad it's Friday. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I'm, and full always, disclosure, I'm, always folks, happy, I'm always happy to hang out here with you because I know it's the end of the week. So that's that's kind of a good way to wrap up my week. I know I, I don't like work to, is I, over after this. I like to have that association with you. And uh, it is a really fun way to wrap up the week. Full disclosure to folks, we're recording a couple hours earlier than normal um, because on on my schedule side, uh, I've I've got something I got to get to afterwards. So the market is still open as Lance and I are talking here. Um, But a lot happened this week, Lance. Lots of data has come out. um, So let's let's, let's just go through it all. Um, Probably, uh, look, let's start with inflation. Um, We got the latest CPI numbers this week. Uh, Headline CPI came in just a hair under uh, most of the forecasts. Um, I think the average forecast was somewhere between like, you know, 5, 5 5.1, 5.2. Some people thinking it was going to pop up a little bit. It actually continued to drop to 4.9%. I think core CPI was a little stickier. Um, Markets, how do they interpret it? Well, it was interesting because on... uh... Tuesday, I think it was on, yeah, it was on Tuesday. I did a, I, I do a before the bell commentary every morning uh, on our web, uh, on our website. Can, can I share something with you about that? That is sure. way TMI, yeah. way too much information <laughs> is, you know, I do my best to get a workout in the morning. And uh, then usually, you know, it's got me scrambling to get ready for my, my next recording. Right. Uh, and so I'm trying just to get caught up in between the workout and the, taking a shower and getting ready for the, uh, the, the recording. And so uh, I listen to your morning recaps while I'm like scrambling <laughs> through the shower. Yeah, way too weird. I know I just made you way too uncomfortable. <laughs> but you're well, my now, shower buddy most mornings. I, I just want you to know that I will now have that vision in my head every morning <laughs> with these, these videos. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> we, 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 we'll have to do it. We'll have to do a, a whole episode of this on like on a Friday, but we're like smoking jackets and, and do the, do the Hugh Hefner, like, you know, alcohol and uh, smoking like jacket. That. I'll, I'll get the week. velvet smoking jacket for next week. Exactly. Uh, so, all right. So anyway, but on Tuesday, I was doing this before the bell video now with an image stuck in my head and <laughs> talking about the CPI report. And I said, look, if the CPI report comes in a lot hotter than expected, like a reading of 5.5% or higher, this market's going to sell off between one and one and a half percent. If we come in uh, somewhere where you're talking about a sub 4.5 percent reading, uh, a big drop in CPI, you're going to see the markets up about one and a half percent. Anywhere close to being on the screws is going to be kind of a nothing burger for the market. And that's exactly what happened. The, the reading came in up four tenths. It was right in line with what the expectations were. I think the actual inflation read was like 4.94, 4.95, but it's 4.9 in terms of anybody else's thing. Um, but yeah, that was that was down from last uh, last week, last month's reading of 5%. So again, you know, we, we keep seeing inflation come down in terms of that. And that's and look, that's a function of the fact that we're looking at data on a year over year basis. And now those comparisons, and you and I talked about this, you know, yeah. last year early on, is that you know, when these year over year comparisons get a lot easier, which is where we are now, that inflation rate is going to start coming down pretty quickly. And, and that's what's happening. It's just, you know, if you take a look at core CPI, it, it is remaining a, little, a, a bit more sticky than the Fed would like. But the headline's coming down quickly because of those year over year comparisons. PPI, which came out on Thursday, also took a big drop. And one of the uh, measures that I watch very closely is the spread between PPI and CPI. That is now negative 7.9, and that's a fairly deep negative reading for that spread between those two indices. And it actually has a bullish and bearish tone to it. Uh, From a bullish perspective, markets tend to bottom when you have a negative spread between PPI and CPI. And the expectation there is inflation is coming down, and that's going to allow companies that benefit from a disinflationary trend, primarily technology, discretionary communications, et cetera. Uh, they will perform better in that environment. And since those are the biggest market cap weightings in the index, it tends to drag the markets higher. A lot of, you know, basically what we've seen since the October lows. Yep. Uh, and the, the, the more bearish read of that is that that negative spread between PPI and CPI said, is basically saying companies can't pass on inflation. And so 
that's going to start impacting profit margins. There's a fairly, fairly high correlation uh, between net profit margins for corporations and that neg- positive to negative spread of, of inflation. Okay. Um, there's, so, so how do you take that investing wise? You make it what you want. <laughs> <It's> yeah. <both> <laughs> well, and, and you you laugh, but at, in a little while, I'm going to ask for Lance the Bull to come talk to us. And then I'm going to ask for his brother, Lance the Bear, to come talk to us uh, because both have published articles this week. Yes, I know. Um, I <laughs> so, um, uh, in inflation, um, the, the the biggest component driving uh, the inflation number to date still is shelter. Yeah. And one thing to note about shelter, two things to note about shelter, um, as you and I have talked about many times, uh, it, it's a very lagging read uh, in in the CPI number. You know, it, it's really reflective of housing prices from. It's not in real time. It's from generally months or quarters ago. Um, and we know from a lot of real time data that that that's coming down in real time. But even in this lagging data, it's clear that the shelter component to CPI has peaked and is beginning to come down. And of course, as we look at all the more recent data in the real estate market, you know we can have a good deal of confidence that that's going to continue to come down and probably accelerate in terms of of coming down. So that should be pulling CPI down as well as the shelter prices begin to catch up to what we've seen over the past you know quarter or two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, headline. Uh, sorry, uh, in the headline CPI number, um, kind of that core shelter housing makes up nearly forty percent of the index. It's a very big chunk, and, and we've said this for a while: is that when you know the housing effect takes hold, it's going to drag. It, it, if everything else just remains stagnant, that's going to drag it down. I mean, we could even see inflation in terms of food prices and energy prices go up, but that headline component of housing is so big it'll drag down the whole index. So, you know, it, it's kind of that way. It's, it's almost we've been waiting on this data to show up. It hasn't showed up yet, but it, it's coming and, and it's just a function of time now. OK, good. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to highlight for folks. I also want to apologize. I don't know if folks can hear the leaf blower outside my studio here, but Murphy's Law being what it is, the guy's just shown up. Um, I've, I've told Lance to get, give me the cut sign if it gets too loud. He hasn't done so yet, so we'll keep going. But my apologies if it, that's a distracting sound to you all. Um, well, I didn't apologize because I've got it going on on my side too. <laughs> this lawnmower just showed up. So in between, I'm dueling lawnmowers as we try to get through this recap this week. Oh my God. Yeah, the, the universe just does not want us to be able to get to the <laughs> checkout part of Friday. Um, okay. All right, well, look, so what's interesting this week is we had the inflation data come out, but then we also had the initial, the latest initial jobless claims numbers come out. And that was a real surprise to the upside, which in jobs jobless claims is, is is unfavorable, right? You know, more, more more jobless claims. That's not what you want to see, right? And it was a pretty big surprise. I think it was a like a four sigma beat compared to the the expected value. So um, I'll put up a chart here of both uh, initial jobless claims and continuing jobless claims. And it's really clear that they bottomed in around September of 2022. That's where the trough was. And that we are now building, looks like building momentum to the upside. And what's really meaningful about this is uh, the Fed has you know, been fighting inflation. And it said, you know, Powell has been very clear. He said, hey, look, I've got this dual mandate, right? I've got price stability, which is being very disrupted by the spike in inflation. And I have full employment and employment is super robust. And as a matter of fact, for a long time, he kept highlighting the the, the gap between um, job applicants and open job positions and saying, look, we just have way more available jobs than we have people who want to work them. So that really gave him confidence to say, OK, I can really lean in to fighting inflation because I don't have to worry about the jobs market. I think. Looking at the BLS numbers, you can still make an argument, oh, given the government reported numbers, employment is still strong. But even those numbers are beginning to show a little bit of of, of, of weakening, at least beginning to. And we talked about that when the JOLTS numbers came out last week. This initial jobless claims just adds further corroboration to the fact that 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 employment, you know, E and that that E in the hope framework of Michael Kantrowitz that we've talked about is now all of a sudden not looking as rock steady as it is. I don't think we can say yet from the the reported data that we have a problem with employment. I don't think we're even close to that yet in terms of the reported numbers. Maybe a different story if we talk about other indicators that we're seeing. But I think this is an important milestone along the way where all of a sudden the analysts are getting surprised 
to the negative side of, of uh, jobless claims beginning to rise faster than, than they thought. What do you think? I think I think that's right. You know, well, first of all, we got to keep this in perspective that yes, jobless claims are up, but not surprising with where the economy is headed. But you know, we're still below three hundred thousand, and you know, normally when you're below three hundred thousand, the economy is still doing fine. Yep. And you know, we saw one point one percent growth in GDP in the first quarter. We'll see you know two percent ish, probably at least according to the Atlanta Fed right now. Um, in the second quarter, that will likely change as we get closer to the end of the quarter. Um, but you know, it is. You know, it is a function that those jobless claims are picking up. And what's interesting is, is that we've had employment in terms of the BLS employment measure um, beat expectations for 13 months in a row. That is the the largest number of beats ever on record um, that's that's ever happened. And, and, and it's by a large margin. I mean, it's not even close as to where, you know, previous sequences of, you know, where uh, numbers were beating estimates had occurred previously. And I thought it was interesting. I posted out on Twitter if I can uh, if I can uh, share a screen real quick, Adam. Go for it. Give me a give me just a moment. Um, I put this out on Twitter this morning and I apologize if you see balloons. I don't know why balloons keep popping up on my Twitter screen today. Um, but every time I shift screens, all these balloons go everywhere. Um, is, so, is that like a really indirect way of saying it's your birthday today? Sort of, yeah, I think so. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we don't celebrate it anymore. I quit at 45. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, but hey, in the comment section below, everybody wish Lance a happy birthday. Yeah, at 58, it just it just doesn't it worth counting anymore. Um, anyway, um, uh, this this chart is a an overlay of jobless claims versus employment. And you know what's really interesting is, is if you look at this chart over time, it's not my chart by the way. This was from uh, J.P. Morgan, um, and it was circulating around this morning. Um, but what's interesting is looking at this chart is that there's a very high correlation when jobless claims start to rise, employment, unemployment starts to rise as well. And that hasn't happened yet. And so we've had this, this fairly noticeable surge in claims, and particularly on the initial claim side, yet unemployment remains at record lows. So I, I don't know what to make of that. You know, we, we talk about, you know, we can certainly make some, you know, statements about, you know, the, the, the data and, and what's happening with the data. It is an election year coming up next year. So maybe that's part of it. I mean, that's, that's kind of hard not to leap to that, especially because <laughs> for months, you and I have talked about how yeah. the BLS data just seems to have so many unbelievable components to it, but whatever. Yeah. Well, and like I said, and when you take a look at the number that, you know, we beat estimates 13 straight, you know, months in a row. And again, something that is so abnormal you, you have to question it. And, and again, I'm trying not to put a tinfoil hat on or anything else. I'm just saying is that there are some anomalies that are going on that haven't happened before. And so you kind of have to scratch your head a bit and go, OK, well, is this time different? And, there, and there's a reason to make that, you know, there is a reason to make that case. Right. Um, we can make the case that this time is different from the standpoint that we laid off so many workers in 2020 that, and companies have hired them back. And, you know, it's, it's like my company as well. We have really, really good employees and we don't want to let them go because we won't be able to hire them back because they'll get a job somewhere else because they're really good employees. So we're going to do everything we can to, to hold on to those employees. And, we, and you know, there's probably a lot of companies right now that, yes, we're seeing some, some, some layoffs. Those are occurring in companies you know, like Meta and, uh, Meta and Google and these other companies that had a whole bunch of excess hiring in 21 and 22. But for a big chunk of companies, they hired back good employees, and now we're into this late what's called labor hoarding. And this is the point in the cycle where companies go, "I don't want to let employees go because I'm afraid I won't get them back, and you know that may impair my business to a degree. So I'm going to hold on to these people as long as I can, possibly, before terminating them." And 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 that's not an, a, you know we've seen that before. We saw labor hoarding back in during the financial crisis as well. So that may be one explanation for this divergence between the data. Uh, ultimately, I suspect that this data will play catch up with claims. It's just a function of time now. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, look, you can look at that chart. Pull, pull the chart back up for a sec. Oh, sorry. You can look at 08 there, and you can see the job hoarding that you're talking about. Yeah. Hold on just a second. Um, there, there we go. So you can see how the blue line gets ahead of the... Uh, the orangey yellowish line there, yeah. um, uh, but but it's it's not for long, uh, and it's you know the, the gap isn't that extreme. And then you look at where we are today, like it's just unprecedented in this what twenty five year data set. 
Yeah, and you saw it back here early in, in 2000, going into that recession, uh, claims were rising and unemployment uh, employment was still falling. Uh, but then it was a very quick, all of a sudden when that realization of the dot-com crisis set in, unemployment surged very quickly. So again, we may, we may have that you know, similar situation you know, coming up here. Again, I, I don't know how long that's going to last, but that, I think that distortion is going to work its way through the system by the end of the year. Yeah. Well, and if it is labor hoarding, that that does sort of have like a tipping point, right? Where you you hold on, you hold on, you hold on, then you're like, you know, all right, I just can't anymore. You know, like where our profits are just gone too negative. We got it. We got to start going to layoffs, and that's where you get that that big snap. So who knows if, if it is labor hoarding? Maybe we, we we see that orange line catch up real fast. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm I'm going to actually share my screen if I can. Sure. Um, and uh, so th this is a chart of initial jobless claims, and it, it that data series was revised relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And you can see here the delta of, of the revised data, which is the red data set here versus the original jobless claims, right? So you look at the original way it was being calculated. It's not really flashing any warning signs. You look at the revised way it's being calculated. You can totally see the September trough and, and where it's taking up here. And, and sort of, you know, to me, this is a bit of an, in, an additional indicator that suggests that you know, a lot of the official reporting is quite generous, right? <laughs> and it's well, only when we see the revisions do we do we hear them. You know, do we see that like, okay, yeah, maybe actually it was <laughs> really underreporting the stuff. Yeah, and look, and and that's the problem with all these mathematical calculations that we use to you know look uh, look a lot of the data is based on guesses and assumptions to start with. Um, you know, we have data sources. We've talked about this before, like with employment. We have ADP and we have paychecks and we have all these payroll companies. Why we don't just collect? I mean, when you put an employee on ADP as an example, you say, OK, I hired Adam today. He, his salary is this. He's a full time employee. His start date is this. His first paycheck will be this date. It will be in this amount. Um, withhold these taxes, et cetera. That all goes into the ADP system. So why we are still relying on telephone surveys to ask people, Adam, are you employed or not? It's kind of ridiculous in this day of age because there's so much real-time data that we have access to that we can just look at it in its purest form. How many full-time employees did we hire in the last month from these six employment companies? Um, and, and you would have a, a much better, re, you know, much better look at real-time data than you do with, you know, all these other kind of government. And plus, we could fire a whole lot of government people. We wouldn't need all these people. Right. Um, but that's a that's a whole other debt. That's limit. probably why we don't have this system. But yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, those uh, what, what they call them um, non-essential workers. So, yeah, uh, that's all different conversation, different day. But anyway, we have all this real time data that, you know, we could get a real look at the labor market on a literally a weekly basis, we could know what was going on just by looking at the number of people hired or terminated in a given week. But again, we just we just don't do that. Yeah, well, look, I'm going to share my screen again here. Um, so there is a um, talk about this with Stephanie Pomboy the other day. Uh, there is a you know another way to look at measuring employment, um, which is withheld employment taxes. Mm -hmm. Right. So yep. this is reported daily by the U.S. Treasury. So when we get the BLS employment numbers, they are generally what they're monthly. Right. So it's like a monthly snapshot and they have all these assumptions baked into them, birth, death models and all sorts of stuff. Right. This is a lot more like what you're talking about, Lance. This is just how many withhold employment taxes uh, did the Treasury take in daily? Right. Now, this is uh, it's a trailing tw 12 month average to try to sort of smooth out the noise. Here and you know what this shows is that growth in withheld employment taxes has basically been plummeting since what's that uh, you know end of 2021 right. right where we turned off the liquidity spigots um, and it's now been plummeting and it's it's you know on its way to going negative here right so it just it tells a far different story than those monthly doctored snapshots that we have. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you want to look at a whole bunch of different indicators. And that's what Michael Kantrowitz, you know, in, in his whole framework, he's got like, you know, 20 different indicators for each of his four main categories. He's not relying on any given one. But the whole point is, is 
you want to look at all of them to see, you know, if you can get a really truer read. And again, if you're just relying on the headline government jobs numbers that are out there, they've been head scratchers for a long time, as you and I have debated back and forth. But seeing some of these alternative sources like withheld employment taxes, you know, I think really does kind of pull back a lot of the the covers that that maybe have been making that headline data, you know, yeah. well, really, I mean, really generous. Yeah. Well, and look, you know, we've been talking about, you know, for the last year or so that, you know, we've had, you know, this big surge in wages and everybody's getting paid more now because of this labor shortage. OK, well, if that's the case, then why did income tax revenues decline this year? Remember, we just filed income taxes on April 15th for last year and you're paying income on your taxes that your that your income is coming in, right? So you get your W-2s, you get your 1099s, your K-1s, et cetera. All, the, all that income tax collect down this year. So that also argues to this idea that, you know, the job market isn't nearly as robust as a lot of the headline numbers make it out to be. Yeah, so that's kind of where I wanted to go with all this, which is up until now, the Fed has been able to be really confident uh, that it can continue to lean into its inflation fighting efforts because it didn't have to worry about the jobs market, mm -hmm. right? And and way too early to tell here, but you and I have 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 uh, you know long postulated that okay, at some point the labor market might break. You start seeing the unemployment rate really start jumping up here. That then all of a sudden potentially potentially starts tying the Fed's hands, or at least we're really going to have to see. How much pain Powell is is really able to tolerate, right? Because that's when pain becomes real for the the general public, right? That's when companies have to lay people off, people lose their jobs, people start screaming for we can't have this, we gotta we gotta go back and pivot. So, um, not saying we're there yet, but I'm saying we're beginning to see signs that you know this long awaited moment could be about to happen. Right. Well, look, there's uh, you know. A good bit of data that supports that. The timing is always the issue, right? And you know, this is one of the the, the challenges of the market and investing right now, which is getting that timing right. Because again, the market's saying one thing, the economic data is saying another. And if the if the market tends to lead the economy by six to nine months, then the economic data is getting about to the point that it should start to actually getting better, not worse. So this is the big challenge in this dichotomy between you know, paying attention to what the market's doing and investing accordingly and paying attention to all these economic numbers that you know, certainly paint a much more dire picture. That's, that's the big challenge. Yeah, all right. Well, look, um, speaking of the big challenge, um, I, I, I wanna do the Lance the Bull and Lance the Bear conversation here. Right. Um, real quick though, right before we get to it, we gotta talk about another big topic, which is uh, the debt ceiling. So uh, that's kind of progressing as expected, right? Where we're, we're seeing more and more dire headlines and all this talk about the X date, right? Which is when the treasury runs out of its ability to do the extraordinary uh, funding measures that it's been taking. Um, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has been saying that that might come as, as soon as June 1st right now, based on the math that she's doing. So, um, uh, you know, and, and issuing all sorts of dire warnings of, you know, it'd be an apocalypse if we ever defaulted. The U.S. has never done that. And, you know, it, it's a lot of excessive uh, catastrophizing on her side, which I get because it's a line, you know, you, someone in her position absolutely doesn't want us to have to cross. Um, now, now the real political theater like gets real serious now. Um, I'll try to find the chart while we're talking here, but but there's a to be able to get a debt ceiling deal done, you have to have all of the parties, both in Congress and uh, House, Senate and Biden, um, all in D.C. at the same time. And if you look at their calendars, I think there's only like four days left in the month where they will all be there in D.C. at the same time. Uh, so if a deal doesn't get struck during that window, which I think is next week, and I'll, I'll try to find this this calendar while we're talking here. Um it, I mean, it doesn't make a deal impossible, but it does make a deal more challenging to get something done before the X date happens here. So um, anyways, lots it, of hand ring real don't. quick, because I just want to give you a chance to respond to it. I'm sure you're getting the same questions I am, Lance, of people who are saying like, all right, well, I just bought more treasuries than I've ever owned in my life before. And we've got this debt ceiling. Am, am I in danger of, of the U.S.? 
treasury yeah. defaulting on my my T bills, my treasury notes? I think yeah. the answer to that is absolutely not. Chances are about zero point zero 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 one. But what do you think? Well, no, the, the 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 chance of the U.S. defaulting on its debt is zero 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 zero. It ain't gonna happen. Um, look, we've been here before, and and what's interesting is so first of all, Janet Yellen is not independent. She serves at the pleasure of the president. She totes the water for the president. So whatever the president wants her to say, that's what she says. And so her message is dire doom, doom and gloom and the world's going to end. And we haven't defaulted on our debt since 19, 1798, which is incorrect, Michelle. And uh, we actually defaulted on our debt in 1979. Um, but this is the, the problem with media rhetoric and everything else and then not, not parsing between the actual data and what talking heads and people that serve a, a political agenda are trying to tell you. Um, the, the, the issue is ultimately is that when we get to the X date, remember we've been here before in 2011, we were at this point, the S&P downgraded US debt to AA from AAA. The market slid by about 20% that summer. And we were all, you know, all everybody was on vacation at the time. And so nobody could get a debt deal done. And then so finally, when everybody came back to Washington, we came together, we got this debt, this debt ceiling limit done, which raised the debt ceiling in exchange for putting together a bipartisan commission that would come up with a trillion dollars worth of cuts that would have an automatic cut date on the 1st of 2013. And that had this bipartisan commission not come up with these cuts, these cuts would be automatically implemented. Well, of course, the bilateral commission didn't do that. And that was when Ben Bernanke at the end of 2012 launched QE3 because he was scared about this fiscal cliff because of this immediate cut of a trillion in spending and what that would impact on the government. But surprisingly, that didn't happen. Markets continued to rally because that trillion dollars in cuts happened across 10,000 agencies and just goes to show you how much waste is in Washington. It didn't even move the needle in terms of government spending because it was so spread out. And so nonetheless, the market continues to rally in 2013, 2014. We're up, you know, 70-80% on the index during that period of time. And everything's fine. Now, during the 2011 debacle, interest rates did spike temporarily because of people repositioning um, over what was going to happen. And then when we actually passed that debt ceiling, the Treasury had to issue debt to repay all the money they borrowed from the federal pension system and from other areas of, of the economy. Now, we did pass that point to where the X date. Um, you know, we were supposed to run out of money. And surprisingly, the government found other areas that they could tap into uh, to get money to keep paying the interest on the debt and Social Security and those type of things. But as we said before, there's two sections of the budget. And you always have to remember this. There's what's called the mandatory spending side of the budget, which is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, prescription drug benefits, military uh, salaries, and interest on the debt. That gets paid, period. End of story. That gets paid. If money has to come up from somewhere else. And this is where Janet Yellen is going, oh, I'm, I'm just not going to agree to prioritizing spending, which that's her just carrying the, the, the Biden water right now because Joe Biden's like, I'm not negotiating on the debt ceiling because you can't cut any of the spending that I want to do. We have a, a debt problem. You've spent too much money. You're going to have to cut spending somewhere. I know you don't want to cut spending because no president wants to cut spending, but at some point you're going to have to cut some spending. So right now, Janet Yellen saying, oh, we can't prioritize payments, but that's exactly what will happen. We'll simply close down national parks. We'll lay off 950,000 non-essential workers that will get furloughed temporarily. And then as soon as we get the debt ceiling raised, they will get a free paid vacation for whatever time they're furloughed because they get all that money back plus their salaries going forward. So th this will get resolved. It's just a function of time until we get there. We've been here 79 times. 49 times under Republicans, the rest of it under Democrats. So this is a bipartisan issue of raising the debt ceiling. Ronald Reagan raised it 18 times alone by himself. So, you know, this is this is not a new thing. And, and it is nothing that you should worry about. The interest is going to get paid. And there's a massive difference between a technical default and an actual default. And we covered this in last weekend's newsletter in detail on the website at realinvestmentadvice.com. But a technical default is, yes, we could potentially miss an interest payment. It's exactly what happened in 1979 because we were debating over the debt ceiling. We missed an interest payment. And five days later, the interest payment was made when they got the debt ceiling lifted and everybody went back to work. So not paying your debt, in other words, a treasury bond comes due and they say, well, we're not going to pay your principal back. That is not going to happen. 
because we will pay those debts. We may be late on interest payments. We may be in technical default for a few days, but as soon as that debt ceiling is limit, uh, lifted, the treasury will issue all the debt it needs. That will probably cause a short-term spike in rates. That will be a great buying opportunity for bonds at that point. When you get that spike in rates, I would buy a lot of long duration treasuries at that point when that occurs, because after that, once we get that done, yields are going to start to come back down rather rapidly towards 3%-ish on the 10-year. Okay. Um, so that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, which is any any increase in yields that result from the uncertainty of the debt ceiling you just see as pretty much a good buying opportunity. Yeah, we actually, uh, so we've, we've actually just today, I know we'll get to our trades later, but um, just today we actually increased, we sold, we had a, uh, in our bond ladder that we have in our portfolio, we had some floating T-bills in our in our portfolio for very short end maturities. We've now moved that out to, to uh, three to five year maturities this, the, the, as a start here. And then when this when this interest de debt ceiling deal is done, then we're going to take a whole bunch of the middle and longer duration and move it out even further. So. OK, great. Um, that's excellent. And, and I, I really do like to use these weekly videos so folks can sort of monitor how you're extending yeah. the duration over time. Um, yeah, everything in baby steps. Yeah. And of course, Always just babies. just for new new viewers here, you're doing that because um, you anticipate yields to come down, you know, over the course of the, the coming year and you want to ride the, the price appreciation, which is greatest at the yeah. furthest end of the duration curve. Right. Yeah. And, that's, and, that's um, a big, and that's a big mistake that a lot of people are making right now. I get a lot of emails from your viewers, right? It's like, oh, we put all my money into two-year treasuries because I want 5%. That's great. Um, as we talked about before, investing is like chess. You have to be thinking multiple moves ahead. So if you went and put your a bunch, all your money in short-term treasuries, the question is, just, what are you going to do next? Because at the end of two years, when yields have now come down, you're not going to be able to reinvest that money into two year treasuries again because that'll be close to zero. So yeah, I mean you you'll be able to you'll just get you a fraction of the money return. For it, yeah. right. So you know if you're if you're you know you have to think about where we're going to be a year or two years from now when you're buying bonds and then figure out well okay well when I get there what's going to be my next move where am I going from there? And that's a real important question you have to answer right now. And that's a big driver of how we're how we're building our bond portfolio is looking out over the next one, three, five, seven, ten 10 years of where we're going to be in terms of economic growth, inflation, those type of things. And that's how we're building our portfolio to, to participate. Okay. So the discussion that I'm kind of seeing on the folks that are tracking the debt ceiling is similar to what you laid out, Lance, which in terms of, look, we've been here before. We know it's going to get resolved at some point. Um, we're kind of coming down to the wire. Uh, and first off, folks, I did find that uh, calendar of availability of, of all the parties to make the decision. I'll, I'll overlay it here. Uh, it looks like those next four days are today is one of them, um, Friday. And then uh, the first three days uh, of, of next week. Um, and then after that, you know, I don't know, someone's gonna have to get on a plane or something like that if, <laughs> if, if they, they make a midnight uh, agreement. Um, but uh, but the question that that sort of in these these veteran experts' minds is just, Okay, so the Republicans are going to hold this up for as long as they can uh, to demand the concessions that they want out of the from the Democrats. The Democrats right now are taking the position of, you know, we're not going to accept any forced spending cuts as a result of this negotiation. Honestly, they're probably going to have to meet in the middle, right? And so the question is just how much stock market pain is it going to require to get everybody to come to a resolution here that just sort of seems to be you know, like they're they're basically holding the markets hostage here at this point. At some point, the markets will freak out enough where somebody's going to want to make a deal to make the pain go away. Well, I know, but the markets have pretty much been telling you this week. I mean, markets really haven't done much this week, right? I, so, I know, which is interesting. It's sort of why I'm asking this. We, I'm raising we this. had we had Pack West back on the verge of default earlier this week. You had this inflation data come in, which is still too hot for the Fed to cut rates. And the markets are pretty much just floating sideways right now. So you know, we're on a sell signal. So kind of the, the little bit of weakness we've had this week is not unsurprising at all because we had a big rally from Mar the mid-March um, when we talked about you know, that we were getting a buy signal and our target was 4,200. We got a rally to 4,168, which was close enough for jazz, as they say, and for my, my previous music career. Um, <laughs> but, you know, 
but you know, we got close enough and, and now we're on a sell signal. We're working through that sell signal period. And yet, you know, markets are really are just consolidating sideways at this point. Um, and so if there, there's really no concern. The market knows that we're going to run this to the very last minute. Um, they're going to meet again next week. That was kind of the latest news headline out. Everybody on both sides, and this and this is you know this is also a bit more of a mis- misnomer, right? Which is oh, the Republicans are holding this up. No, it's not the Republicans holding this up. It's not the Demo- it's the, it's both Republicans and Democrats. You have to sit down at a table and negotiate this out. And the first set of the negotiations were here's what we want from the Republicans, and the Democrats were like, we don't care. We're not doing anything. That's not a negotiation. That's being a crybaby. So if you want to have a negotiation, you have to sit into a room as adults. And again, the whole problem is we have no adults in Washington at all, period, whatsoever. Um, you sit in a room and say, look, you know, you just spent $1.7 trillion of money we don't have. We need to cut some of the spending back to try to move back to some normal. Of a- and you're going to have to give we're not going to get all the cuts that we want. That's okay. We're, we're willing to give up, you know, some of this because we know we, we've got to do that to get a negotiation done. That's what should be going on in Washington. But uh, again, we have children and they're all throwing tantrums and trying to make political narratives uh, to their benefit. And this is the big thing. Look, I have a lot of, I have a lot of acquaintances that work in Washington and what you hear from these people in the media and what they say behind the closed doors are two mm-hmm. very things. You know, they throw outrage on television. It's like, oh my gosh, this, that, and the other thing. And then behind closed doors are like, well, you know, this is really kind of what we got to do. And, you know, so you've got to really just separate all this stuff out for what it is. At the end of the day, this will get resolved. Nobody, nobody wants on their record that they caused a debt default. Nobody. I don't care who you are, Republican, Democrat, Independent, President, Congress, Senate, even Joe Manchin today, one of the, the levers that uh, that the uh, Republicans may have is that even Senator Joe Manchin, who is a Democrat from Virginia, came out today and said, this this spending is not kosher, right? We've, we've got to get this debt ceiling done. And what the Democrats are asking for is not really. What, what, what he was reacting to, as I read it, is the blanket, look, we're not going to accept yeah. any spending concessions. He just said, look, that, that's not realistic. And he, he said, look, it's not realistic because it's the way these things have always been resolved. He's like, oh, so, yeah, so, and, and, I, so, I, so I stand corrected. We have one adult, Joe Manchin, in the room. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was like, look, when, when we've been on the other side of this, we've wanted that. Like, like basically, it's just like you can't, you can't take, you can't come in with a with a blanket refusal because otherwise exactly. this doesn't work. We don't exactly. find consensus. Um, okay. So, um, but, 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 but what, what, what I was say is just to wrap that up. Yeah, yeah. We what has to happen right now? There's time. So there's no pressure, right. right? Everybody can play their game to the best of their ability for media headline sake right now. Um, but when this gets down to the last minutes and you know, like the Mission Impossible movie, it's always, you know, five seconds till it detonates and it's right. going to get resolved. Five seconds before detonation, we'll all come to an agreement. This will get Okay. Started. And that's kind of where I was going with this, which is surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but a little surprisingly, the markets haven't seemed worried yet about this. Do you think that as the clock ticks down, we're going to see the markets begin to sweat? Maybe. Um, again, you know, the, the, cohesiveness, the, the cohesiveness of the market has been very good. Um, you know, there, there's, there's trouble with the market. Now, so, so don't, you know, you can't take what I say as a blanket statement, because when you look at this rally this year, it's been driven by a very small number of big cap stocks, right? That's been a big driver. Uh, breadth of the market has been pretty weak here. So we're due for a good rotation. I'm looking forward to one uh, where we can get some of the sell-off in some of these tech names, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, which are all trading three standard deviations above moving averages. They're very overbought um, because I'd love to buy some more. We own them and I'd love to buy some more of them, but they're just too expensive right now to buy. Um, So I'm looking forward. I would love a bit of a sell-off here uh, to accelerate. And, and I think this summer is a reasonable potential where we can maybe get a five to a 10% correction in the markets. Uh, very normal. That happens every single year of the markets, you know, historically, five to 10% correction, completely normal. In fact, you know, in, in, uh, in most given years, you have at least one to two 5% corrections in any given year. So, you know, um, you know, that would be a good opportunity to potentially add some exposure to portfolios because the trend of the market remains bullish. The underlying uh, functioning of the market still remains bullish. And until that changes, 
there's no reason to get, you know, ultra, ultra bearish at this point. Okay. Um, that is a great segue into this next section here. Um, so uh, if I can, I'd like to talk to Lance Roberts, the bull, um, <laughs> the, uh, the fellow who put out this, uh, this article this week uh, called The Commitment of Traders Extreme Positioning Suggests the Bears May Be Wrong. Um, okay. So can you walk me, us through... Pardon? Yeah, let me go get him real quick. Be right back. So okay, good, good. Uh, and, and let him know that if he wants to talk to any of the charts uh, in this uh, article, he's welcome to screen share too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, you know, there's so the, so it's interesting that so when you take a look at the at the markets, right? There's been a couple of things that have been going on in the markets in particular, and we take a look at the volatility index as an example. Extremely low. I mean, we're trading below twenty on the volatility index. Now there's you know, we've talked about before, you and I, about the zero days to, uh, to expiration option mania that's been going on. And that's been distorting the VIX to some degree. So there is that. But volatility as an assumption has been fairly low. Again, we haven't had big swings in the markets this year, um, kind of like we saw last year, where markets were moving 10 and 20 percent in two directions. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that this year. Um, so volatility has been very suppressed. And so they got me kind of digging around what's called the commitment of traders report. And what the commit, there's, there's basically three layers of traders and, and options and futures. And there's the commercial hedgers. Now, these are people like farmers that are, are, are ranchers. And so they've got a, they're raising a bunch of head of cattle or they're raising corn and they're going to deliver that to the market at some point. Well, you know, if you're, you know, if you're out in the middle of Oklahoma raising corn, you know, you, it's subject to tornadoes and everything else coming along. And, and you have these weather events that can wipe out your entire crop, or you could have some type of disease crop up that wipe out, wipes out your entire crop. So these people, so these farmers go out and they hedge their, their crops so that in the event something happens, they, they can lock in a price for that, for that harvest, right? Right. And so they're, they're not speculating. It's just pure insurance buying, basically. Pure insurance buying. And then there's the retail traders. And that's a very small fraction of options transactions that go on. The big movement in options is the non-commercial traders. Now, this is basically Wall Street uh, hedge funds, Wall Street primarily, uh, basically trading options on commodities and you know, oil and uh, food and agriculture and everything. Else. You know, this is you know, the, the, go back to the trading places with uh, Eddie Murphy, right? The the whole orange, the orange crop report, right? The the Duke, the Duke brothers with the frozen orange juice concentrate, yeah, exactly. So that's the speculation. Oh, is, are, is there going to be a shortage of oranges this year in Florida because of a drought, and that's going to drive? That's going to mean too little supply relative to the demand. For oranges. And so they're going to bet long on you know, orange futures that, you know, there's going to be a big price rise in oranges, right? So that's how they make money. So you kind of look at this data on a, what we call a net short basis. So you take, you, you basically look at how many people are long a commodity or an index or whatever it is, and how many people are short the index and then net the two out. And, you know, and if more people wind up being long, right, uh, you know, everybody, in other words, everybody's expecting the markets to go up as an example. And everybody's long. Typically, the way it works, and that's a psychological thing within the markets and a contrarian investing basis, is that when everybody thinks one thing's going to happen, something else tends to happen. And same thing occurs when you have everybody assuming that prices are going to go down. Well, think about the market over the last year. And no matter what you listen to in the media and the press and everything else, everybody's super bearish. Oh, you know, so it's this, you know, yeah, interest rates are going up, and this is happening with the economy. And you know, this is going on with the Fed, and we're hiking interest rates, and there's a million reasons why this market's going to have another financial crisis of 2008. In fact, it might even be worse this time. We're just going to be in a massive bear market. Well, there's a lot of people that think that. And so if you take a look at the net positioning of S&P futures, they're negative. They are net short to a very, very large degree. In fact, they haven't been this short, the market, since 2020 uh, during the shutdown. So again, this just kind of goes back to that contrarian basis that when everybody assumes one thing's going to happen, something else tends to occur. Now, where this tends to play out in the favor of the bears is that during a bear market, right? So in a market that has a negative trending of prices. So go back to 2008, 
We broke the bullish trend. We were trending negatively. We were trading below the 200-week moving average on a consistent basis. That's a very negative environment for prices. That net short position was confirming that bear market. During a bull market where markets are trading and trending above the 200-week moving average on a consistent basis, which we are still doing today, then the net, big net short positions were actually buying opportunities. It was basically where the bottoms of corrections were occurring. And so if you take a look at the correction from January of 2022 to where we were in October of 2022, that correction came down, tested the 200-week moving average. We had a big net short position in the markets. And that's helped, that big net short positioning is helping fuel this rally that we've had since those October lows. So that's the, that's the bullish aspect to the market is that you have a buying support or fuel, so to speak, for the markets to go higher because of everybody being that short. The further the prices go up, the more people that have to cover their short position, which fuels more buying, which fuels more short covering, which fuels more buying, so forth and so on. Okay, so um, largely, and I'm oversimplifying here, the argument is just um, everybody's over on one side of the boat. Yeah. When that happens, the opposite oftentimes happens. Position accordingly. Okay. Yeah. So that's Lance the bull. Now, if you don't mind, right, you call. Whoop, go ahead. Real quick, real quick, before we finish that though, you have yeah. the exact same setup on bonds. By the way, you have a you have the largest net short positioning on Treasury bonds right now that you've had since 2020 as well when we shut the shut the economy down. So, um, and that. And of course, you know, right after that was when yields fell to about half a percent. So you've got the same exact bullish setup on a contrarian basis in bonds that you have in stocks. And that's really the, the, the question of the article, which is, can, can, can the bears be wrong on both stocks and bonds at the same time? And there's a historical situation that has occurred ever since the Federal Reserve has become invested in supporting financial markets since 2000. Stocks and bonds have been positively correlated over periods. So prior to 2000, there was a negative correlation over periods. And so when stocks were going up, bonds were going down and vice versa. So there was a natural hedge. Since 2000, that hasn't been the case. And we right now, we have a negative correlation between stocks and bonds, but that's likely temporary. And probably what's going to happen is these big net short positions of both stocks and bonds are going to fuel buying and that correlation will come back and we'll get both a rally in stocks and bonds at the same time, much like we saw since 2009 as well. Okay, so help me understand this. Uh, I didn't realize that that the shorts were so concentrated in, okay. in bonds. Um, if, if so many people, if the market is still anticipating a Fed pivot sooner than the Fed is guiding that it's going to pivot, why are so many people short bonds? They're still looking at inflation running at, you know, five, five and a half percent, you know, five, five percent-ish, right? Um, they're still looking at Fed funds at 5%. They're still expect and look, and, and listen to most of the people that you hear, right? It's like interest rates are here. That means that, you know, the economy is going to crash and all this, all this bad stuff is going to happen. And so you get a lot of people that are shorting bonds as both a hedge for portfolios, but also you remember everybody looks at hindsight and see bonds were a poor performer last year. So every time you got to get a rally, you get people shorting bonds again, expecting that negative trend to occur because that's the recency bias that's occurring in the markets. I guess so. I mean, I just keep hearing that hey, the market's forward looking, you know, it's maybe already priced us through this recession. The bond market's the smartest money in the, the markets. Uh, and so you would think if it's calculating a pivot sooner that it would be more bullish on bonds, well, but now, clearly you not. But right, you're, but you're also talking about two different groups of people. You're talking about speculators versus investors. So what you have on the commercial, on the commercial side is speculators. On the right. non-commercial side is speculators. Those people speculating on short-term price movements. And you know, remember, these contracts are not 10-year contracts that they're buying. These are very short-dated contracts you know, between a month and a year in most cases. And so they're, and, and a lot of these non-commercial uh, traders are basically hedging other positions for pension funds, hedge funds, you know, this type of thing. So there's more that goes on to this than just people saying, oh, there's a bet here. You know, everybody's betting the market's going to go down. There's more to it than that because- Got it. So in other words, you, you, might be, you might be short, tr short bonds here, but it might be an offset trade to a long bond trade that you have somewhere else. Well, right. So even just think about how an option works. So there's two people on, on each side of an option contract. There's the buyer and the seller. 
So if you want to buy a bond contract for me, so let's just say I'm Wall Street for the moment and you're, you're an individual and you say, Lance, I want to buy a million contracts on treasury bonds saying that the price is going to go up and yields are going to go down. So I give you a contract for that trade. And so that means, though, that I have to take the other side of that trade. So I'm now short treasuries to give you the option that you want because there has to be both sides of a transaction. Right. So that's how a lot of this occurs in the market. But the, the, the bigger issue of all this, and not to get, I don't want to get too lost in the forest or the trees, is that negative short position is fuel. So if yields start to come down rather sharply for any reason, we have a hiccup in the economy, whatever occurs, the Fed starts slashing rates all of a sudden. When that, those yields start coming down, that's going to force all these net short positions to cover right. as those prices start to move against them. And that just adds, it's, it's like margin debt, right? It just adds fuel to the fire when it occurs. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. So uh, that was Lance the Bull. If his brother could come on in here, the guy that wrote um, why future returns could approach zero this week. <laughs> why don't you walk us through that? And, and, and I'm doing this exercise too, just to let people know, as you said earlier, like it's, it, it, it's a rough time in the markets because you can kind of argue pretty easily both sides of the the tape right now. Yeah, and look, and then, and you know, remember when these articles that are right, these are just me and Mike doing research. This is this this is us walking through, you know, our kind of analysis, trying to figure all this stuff out, and and so the way that we do our research is we quantify things better when we write about it. So when you've got to start putting stuff into writing. And, you know, building charts and analyzing the data and then putting some contextualization around this data about what it means, it, it gives us a better focus on what to do with our portfolios. And so when you read our articles, we're not just making a, a you know, a lot of people write articles just for the sake of writing articles. They don't actually manage to book the business. We manage a book of client money, right, over a billion dollars worth. And so we write our research. So, A, it's transparency. So, you know what we're thinking. But also, B, it's just how we're quantifying our actions that we're taking within portfolio. So that's that's why, you know, it, it, I'm not talking out of two sides of my mouth and saying, look, I can make a bullish case, but there's some bullish, there's some bearish things we need to be aware of because that's the risk. It's easy to be invested on the long side of the markets, but you got to be aware of the risk. And that's what all this other work is about. Yeah. And, and I want to give you kudos for doing this one. I mean, when you're, you're doing the work that that you should be doing as a, a capital manager, which is you're you're doing your analysis. I mean, you, you hope that anybody who's managing your capital is is not just winging it based on gut feel that they're doing real analysis. You're actually showing that, yeah, you guys do the real analysis. But but as you argue both sides, right, which I know you and Michael have to do as part of your discipline, right? You know, you sit down and one of you takes the bear side, one of you takes the bull side, you debate it, and then you decide at the end of the day what to do about it. You're making that visible to not just your clients, but to the world at large. And that, that that's a real gift. There's a lot of there's a lot of managers that wouldn't be willing to be that vulnerable. Um, so I want to commend you for that. I well, appreciate that. Yeah. We, we, trust me, when we're wrong, we get a lot of emails. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. And I, I'm just being nice to you because it's your birthday. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so so there's actually two parts. So so it was interesting. I published this article on Friday talking about why futures returns could be zero. And I've written these articles before based around valuations and you know a, a lot of other mathematics, right? And it was interesting. I posted this article and immediately some guy tweeted me back and he's like, you should read Hussman's work and understand he's all mathematical based. It's like, I'm not talking about valuations. In this instance, I'm not talking about valuations. Valuations are a definite import, of uh, definite importance to future returns. What valuations tell you is that if you're overpaying for an asset today, your future return is going to be less tomorrow, right? If I pay $500,000 for a $250,000 house, I'm not going to make money on the house. It's just the way it's going to work. But this article has nothing to do with valuations because that is a valid argument. I'm not arguing against expensive valuations, which we have right now. That does argue for lower returns in the future. Um, but this is a different take. And what we're looking at is the impact of two factors primarily, which is massive amounts of liquidity and 5% money market rates. And those have a potential impact that people really haven't thought about much uh, as of late and really talked about much. 
And if you take a look at the market returns um, of, of the market going back to 1925, and I used some, some data from the New York uh, Stearns University. And you look at returns on an annualized basis from 1925 to 2008. And on average, it's exactly what you would expect. The market's generated about 8% a year, a little bit more. And that's price appreciation plus dividends over that time frame. And that pretty much aligns with economic growth, uh, inflation, and dividends. And that's, so that's kind of exactly what you would expect from the markets, that 8% rate return. Well, since 2009, We've averaged 12% annually. That's 400 basis points more than what we averaged from 1925 to 2009, right? So just, just you know, you're, you're talking about a 50% increase in the rate of return. And economic growth at 2% certainly does not support an additional 400 basis points of return over that time frame. So where did it come from? Well, it came from the fact that we had zero interest rates, money, there was, there was no ability to leave money in savings at that point. So money had to get pushed into either investments or markets or something, right? It had to be put out there. I either, I either had to go take my cash and build a business with it, or I had to invest it in the stock market or something. I had to do something to get some rate of return on my cash. So zero interest rates was a big, a big function of that. And then another $43 trillion in liquidity. We spent 10 times, we spent $10 for every dollar's worth of growth that we got out of the economy over that 12 year period. So that is just unsustainable. And right now, at least at this point, I don't see any big spending bills on the horizon that is going to contribute to another TAMP, HARP, HAMP, um, uh, cash for clunkers, cash for utilities, all mm -hmm. of these things that we did, you know, following the financial crisis. I don't see any of that in the pipeline right now. Um, the Fed is reducing their balance sheet through quantitative tightening. There's no reason at this moment for them to go back to quantitative easing because everything's doing okay. And even if the Fed does cut rates because the economy is slowing down, unless we have some type of financial crisis of magnitude, there's gonna be no reason for them to, Q, to do QE. So there's nothing really there to support that liquidity push is, is at least at this moment not there to support these above average growth rates in financial markets over the foreseeable future. So if that is the case, we're gonna go back to what a market should return which is economic growth plus dividends plus inflation, which is four to six percent, right? Um, that's just where we're going to be. And then if you start looking at potentially slower economic growth, that's how you start talking about inflation rates. Uh, sorry, growth rates coming back towards that zero rate of return level has nothing to do with valuations. Valuations are another problem entirely. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the impact of five percent money market rates. At five percent money market rates, and just assuming the Fed leaves interest rates where they are, they don't bring rates back down to zero again. Markets are doing okay. Economy's doing okay. Nothing's falling out of bed right now. So no reason for the Fed to cut rates. I know everybody, the market's expecting the Fed to cut rates by 120 basis points by the beginning of next year. There's no reason to cut rates unless something's gone wrong, right? And nothing's gone wrong yet. Doesn't mean it won't, but it just mm -hmm. hasn't yet. So assuming everything remains status quo at 5%, why do I, if 5% if is my number in the bank, 6% is my number in the stock market from taking risk, why put money in the stock market? Right. Five percent. I'll just collect my five percent and, and and go home. I don't need the risk. I don't need the volatility. I don't need the headache. And and so that extracts capital from the markets as well. So again, that potentially adds another drag to this liquidity flow that we've had over the last decade. Now again, that's just one kind of issue that is sitting out there. Just it's just something we're thinking about. It's like okay, we had all this money driving these returns. And we have money chasing ridiculous assets. What, what's going to, what's going to, and, and the, the, the premise of the article basically is okay, well, if that's what that was, what's going to be the next driver of asset prices that's going to take Apple and Mike, you know, Microsoft and Google all the way to the moon? Well, the only answer then comes back to share buybacks, and which share buybacks have made up about 40% of the return in the market since 2011. But there's a limit to how many share buybacks you can have. Eventually, Apple will go private if they keep buying back $90 billion a year <laughs> yeah. in, in, in stock buybacks. Yeah, and you know, beyond the very few super deep-pocketed companies like the Apples and the Microsofts of the world, yeah. a lot of share buybacks were funded by borrowing super cheap yeah. debt, right? right? Which isn't there anymore, right? 
So you have problem. fewer and fewer companies that can afford to do meaningful buybacks. That's right. So again, you get a bifurcated market, you get a handful of stocks driving the markets higher, you get a bunch of stocks that are lagging the market, and most people don't just buy 10 stocks, they have a basket of stocks. And you know, if you want to try and buy and hold an index, you can get average rates of return over time. You won't get superior returns, but you can get average rates of returns just buying an index. But that average rate of return may wind up being zero over a decade. And before you say that can't happen, between 2000 and 2015, the return on the S&P index was zero for 15 years. So it, it can happen. It's happened all throughout history. There's a uh, there's a meme I'm going to put up here, um, Lance. Uh, I'm going to have to find it later on, but I'll put it up here when we edit this. Where it's um, <laughs> it, it's it's three photos on top of one another. The top one is uh, a, a mother with her child um, in the pool playing and laughing. She's like holding him above the water, and it it says like the S and P five. <laughs> huh? um, and then beneath it, it, it it you see this kid struggling to like keep his head above the water line. He looks like he's about to start drowning. And that's the S&P 495. Right. <laughs> and then beneath it, you see submerged at the bottom of the pool, this like skeleton in a chair. And it's like the Russell, you know, 2000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, it, it's, it's, that's a terribly funny uh, meme, but it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a bit true right now. Too. I was going to say, we, we, we laugh through the tears because it's so on point, right? We actually uh, put out a series of charts. It was actually very, Mike Leibowitz did this this morning. So every morning on realinvestmentadvice.com, we put out a daily market commentary, um, which goes to, it's, it's three minutes to read it. We email it to you in the morning at 7.30. So if you subscribe at the website, we'll email it right to you. Um, but it was interesting this morning, he did a, a study of the NASDAQ, the, tri the triple Qs, the spiders, and the RSP, which is the equal weight S&P 500 index. And it's very interesting when you take a look at the RSP, the equal weighted index, it's not nearly as bullish looking as the S&P or the NASDAQ, which the top 10 stocks of the NASDAQ and the S&P are virtually the same. So those stocks are rallying hard, but because of the equal weighting in the, the RSP index, it doesn't have near the performance because you don't have that big market cap hangover that you have in, in spiders and cues. Hmm. Oh, all right. Well, look, I mean, this all just sort of underscores again um, what a tricky market it is, especially for the individual investor to navigate because really smart, long experienced uh, portfolio managers like yourself can make, you know, again, pretty compelling arguments all along the, the bullish and bearish spectrum here. We'll get to your trades uh, in, in just a bit. Um, a couple of things I, I, I want to touch on with you before we, we end up here. Um, Normally, we, we check in on, on housing and uh, layoffs. Um, I'm going to skip the layoff counter this week. We've talked enough about the employment market. H housing, I just want to ask real quickly because it just still just sort of blows my mind. Um, home builder stocks. I don't get them. These things are just, they're crushing it. I mean, they're almost all at their all-time highs right now. And I, I can't see anything, anything in the macro landscape uh, that makes me feel like I should be optimistic at all, let alone the most optimistic for these guys. I mean, I, I guess they're at a point in their business cycle where they can still make good cash flows or something here, right? But well, is it, is, the, again, is this just a screaming short or is there a reason that they should be up here? Um, look, it's not a screaming short, that's for sure, because the trend has been so powerful in those stocks. This is not short covering. This is not you know, kind of some anomaly that's going on. There is a very strategic set of buying. These stocks aren't shooting straight up. It's a very, it's a sloping 45 degree. It's just a consistent buying in these companies. And, and part of the argument is, is that the supply of, of new homes is still short. So there's not a lot of supply of new homes coming to market. So there's plenty of room for builders to build. And when you look at existing home sales, that inventory is really shrunken a lot because, if, if, you know, if I'm a home owner, um, so, so, you know, go back in time here. I sold my house last July, right? At the peak of the market, I was like, honey, we're getting stupid prices for our house. We're selling it. And she's like, okay, fine. So we've been renting and we finally bought another house. Um, but if I'm sitting in my house right now and I'm going, you know, prices are coming down. Maybe, you know, we've kind of thought about selling our house, but maybe we should go ahead and think about selling our house. 
Well, the problem with that is, is that your mortgage probably right now is somewhere between two and a half and three and a half percent. So if you sell your house, what are you going to do? Because now you go to buy another house and, and when you go to buy another house, the house prices really haven't come down that much. So now you're going, well, if I sell my house, I got to go buy another overpriced house. And now my mortgage is going to be 6%. Not two and a half or three or three and a half percent, which means my mortgage payment goes up. I'm just going to sit where I am. So this is the this is the the problem now that exists with an existing home site is that you've got a lot of people that might sell, but there's nowhere for them to go. So they're not selling. the 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 people that want to buy houses, they're caught in between this issue of mortgage payments being too high versus the available inventory. And and there and there's a bunch that are sitting around going, "Well, I'm going to buy a house as soon as prices come down," but they don't come down. So it's a very interesting dynamic that we're sitting in. And I think that's what's feeding into these home builder stocks, which is, and again, I'm not long any home builder right now because I can't justify the values. They're cheap, but I can't justify, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same mental. Wait, 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 wait. Why do you say they're cheap? <clears throat> they're traded at nine, 10 times earnings. Really? Okay. The PEs are actually, I haven't looked at the PEs recently. Yeah, well, look, I mean, here, the, the, I'm not, I won't share my screen, but here, let me just pull up a couple here just to look at real quick. Um, but, you know, like Toll Brothers, which is one of the bigger home builders in the country right now. I mean, they trade at a Ford PE of eight. Their current PE is five. Their price to sales is 0.69. Uh, yeah. You know, so they're in 0.3. Over the last years, they grew sales at 12%. Their quarter of a quarter EPS was up 40%. So there's nothing in, you know, fundamentally speaking, looking at these companies going, you know, these are so expensive, I can't buy them, right? There's the fundamentally, they're, they, they look completely fine. They're very overbought right now. I wouldn't buy them simply because they're extremely stretched. Beezer Homes trades at a Ford PE of five, has a price to sales of 0.28, um, doesn't pay a dividend. But you know these are you know these are cheap stocks and and they're still growing earnings over time. You know I think there's still going to be a bit of an upcoming in these. And again, one of the reasons I'm not buying these stocks right now on the home builder side is and probably y'all can you know in six months or a year say Lance you were stupid for not buying uh, you know home builder stocks. But I think at some point I, I'm kind of in your camp saying there seems to be a disconnect between these home builder stocks and what's going on in the, in the whole in, in the in the the housing space. And, you know, it seems like there's going to have to be a price correction to kind of catch up with just reality of what's happening in space. But if homes start to improve, you know, we're going to be looking back going, yeah, home builder stocks in October figured out that the bottom of the housing market was a lot closer than we thought. And people started buying those. So the question is, is who's leading and who's lagging right now? We'll find out. All right. Um, God, maybe I should just bring one of these guys on for an interview to crawl in their heads and, 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 have them I mean, say you, what's going on. Dude, if you could get somebody from Toll Brothers, Beezers, you know, somebody like that on your show, that I think that'd be a great insight as to what's going on with yeah, Pull T KB. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll look into it. Um, and folks, if there's interest in that, you know, let me know. If there's enough, I'll, I'll bump it up on the party list. Um, all right. So, um, uh, given where we are with time, I'll, I'll, I'll begin to start sort of landing the plane here. But there's, there's, there's one thing I wanted to get your reaction to, which was. Um, about two, three weeks ago, um, I had had booked uh, a guy named Ramit Sethi, um, and he's a some personal finance guru. Um, he's a bit of a younger guy. Um, you know that that space is kind of dominated by the Susie Ormans and Dave Ramseys of the world. Um, Ramit right. is kind of the the next generation of that. And um, his folks were really excited to have him come on this program the day we were going to re uh, record it because I was going to be able to launch it the same day as his new Netflix series uh, released. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll pull it up here in a second, but I think it's called like How to Be Rich or I Can Make You Rich or something like that. But it's a, it's a new series on Netflix. I actually just started watching it last night. Um, and it's kind of like a like a financial makeover series where he, he, you know, parachutes into the lives of individual people and he finds out kind of what their current financial situation is. And, you know, most of these people have something, some big issue going on and he says, okay, well, look, you know, let me, let, let me, let me help you kind of get cleaned up and made over here and, and, you know, put you on a much better trajectory to hit your goals. Um, and, 
you know, it, it, it's good. I mean, I, I love seeing this type of stuff. I think we just yeah. need a lot more of it out in the world because as you and I have talked about forever, our, our education system doesn't teach financial literacy. And most of these people have found themselves in bad, into bad situations because they just didn't know any better, right? Um, so, you know, he's, he's helping them sort of understand the errors of their ways and come up with plans to, to get things better. It's not rocket science. I mean, these are pretty, the advice is relatively simple and straightforward, you know, get your spending under control, you know, try to pay off your debts, you know, start trying to put some money away to build towards your future, all that type of stuff. But one thing he said that kind of, I just earmarked that I wanted to talk with you about is um, one of the the people to kind of pay off some of their debt and, and get some capital to work with. Uh, they sold their house and they lived in LA. So they were getting a lot of money for their house. And he asked, okay, great. What are you going to do with that cash? And the woman said, oh, well, I'm going to give it to my financial advisor. And he said, oh, really? Well, is your financial advisor charging a, a management fee? And she said, well, yeah, of course. And he, he sort of said, oh my goodness, like I never recommend anybody do that. And basically he's sort of with the mindset of you put yourself in sort of an age-weighted uh, you know, uh, index fund and you let it ride. And that way you get the market return over time and you've got the lowest percent management fee. Sure. And <clears throat> You know, I, I, that's a different model than the financial advisors that wealthy on endorses and, and being super clear. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of value that an active manager can bring. We've talked a lot about on this channel about how we're entering an era where active management is highly likely going to come back to the forefront as kind of a necessity for, for good returns going forward. We've had this luxurious kind of 20 plus year era where of, of just intense uh, central planner intervention in the markets, where the markets were just on the steady kind of 45 degree ramp upwards over time and passive strategies worked great then. Um, but we're probably in an era right now where, you know, the, the risks of downdrafts and then losing years, perhaps sometimes even more in a downdraft becomes a lot more possible. And so having a good active manager who at a minimum can limit your downside risk, but also perhaps help you get better upside by investing in, you know, the, the better, uh, you know, the, 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 the diamonds uh, in a sector versus just the general sector, which, you know, general sector ETFs did great in this easy era that we just had. Personally, I think that becomes much more important. And, and I really value the management fee model because it aligns the economic interests of the advisor with the economic interests of the client. But that being said, um, Seti has his own you know, opinion here, and I just wanted to address it head on, Lance. W what's your reaction to kind of his comment and his outlook there? No, look, uh, there, there, there's a, a million people out there that are promoting financial you know, planning. Uh, Dave Ramsey was the kind of a forerunner of this entire uh, situation. And I agree with a lot of, you know, probably what he's telling her. Um, I get a lot of emails from, you know, people on Wealthion and they say, you know, hey, I'm just starting out investing or I've got, you know, $20,000 I want to get, you know, I want to start investing with. And, I'm, and I email them back and I say, buy an S&P index fund and stick as much money into it as you can every single month and call me in 30 years and you'll be great. And, you know, the, the, the point is, is that for individuals that have a very small amount of money, again, we go back to look at the people he's dealing with. They have a financial problem that they're trying to solve. These are not people that have their financial act together that are now looking to grow and preserve their wealth over time. And that's a, you know, we, we look at ourselves uh, often as, you know, where you go after you graduate Dave Ramsey, right? So Dave Ramsey's high school, you get yourself out of trouble. And then once you start getting on your path to building wealth, then you come talk to a company like us where we focus on, and again, you know, people mistake the fact that you and I are talking and we're talking about what the market's doing and, and we're, you know, what stocks are we buying? And it's all very sexy and glamorous. That's a very small part of our business. I'm just the portfolio manager in our business. I'm not the guy that is your advisor in our business. So when you want to talk about your portfolio with me, more than happy to do that. But your advisor is a certified financial planner, deep, deep knowledge in, in financial planning, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these other you know, insurance, all these other types, state planning, all these other things that are so very important to not only building wealth, but preserving wealth over time. That's what your financial advisor is for. If you're just buying a financial advisor to go trade stocks for you, 
go buy an index because you will do a lot better over time doing that because you will get average, you won't get superior returns. You'll get average returns over time. You'll get the market less your expense ratio. So you won't beat the market. You'll still underperform the S&P, but you'll at least kind of track what the index is doing over time. And as long as you don't get into a period of 10 or 20 years of negative returns or zero returns, you'll probably get to your retirement goal. But that's the important differentiator. Uh, again, so when you go to talk to a financial advisor, what are they doing for you to get you from where you are to where you want to be? And what is the pathway of achieving that? It's not just the portfolio management. That If you're expecting to invest in the markets and get rich from that, and it's going to solve your financial needs by investing in the markets, you are going to wind up losing a lot of money and you're going to have less money than what you started with down the road. And the reason is, is that if you treat the market like a casino, it's going to treat you like a casino. It's going to take your money. The house always wins. If you treat the market for what it is, which is a place to grow wealth over time, you keep your expectations realistic and actually be conservative about your expectations. Great. The market did six. I grew four. Awesome. Perfect. That means you're taking less risk. You'll preserve that growth over time. And the important thing about building wealth is how much money you can save, not how much money you invest. So the more money you save, the higher the propensity of you reaching your financial goals are going to be there. And again, all the, all the market is there to do is to ensure that the purchasing power of your savings is the same 30 years from now as it is today. That's why you, you invest and, and invest conservatively over time. But again, it's the speculation that gets people in trouble every single time. Yeah, well, and you know, I'm going to try to prevent ending this thing on a long rant, but like you and I have <laughs> talked about how um, we have increasingly, because of central planner intervention in the market, um, we have pushed people largely to become speculators, right? Yeah. So um, up until just recently, you, you, you couldn't get a material return by kind of playing it safe and conservative. Right. So people who otherwise should have been and wanted to be conservative were being forced out the risk curve. I always liken it like kind of being pushed out on a on a pirate ship plank, you know, <laughs> sword at your back kind of deal, because people that needed to live on a fixed income weren't getting any returns. So they had to be in other instruments to, to get that return. Or, you know, the younger generations were just saying, like, look, you know, everything's gotten so darn unaffordable. The only way I've got a shot at being able to kind of afford the the general American dream, um, being able to afford a house, you know, that type of stuff is I got to catch a winning lottery ticket here. And so I got to jump into a meme stock or a crypto that's shooting the moon or, or whatever. Um, and, and then, of bad. course, with 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 the central planners setting the tune of the markets by you know, crushing interest rates to record lows for so long and pumping so much, you know, QE into the market. Everybody switched from analyzing the fundamentals of companies to just trying to speculate what the Fed chair and a couple of other people around a table, you know, in the Eccles building were going to decide to do next, right? Well, it, it, it's even more than that, though. I mean, look at what we've done to society. You know, it, it's, it's a very sad statistic. There was an article out the other day. Uh, don't quote me on the source. I believe it was Pew Research, but I could be wrong. Um, but it was, a, it was a think tank. Uh, just go with that. Um, <laughs> The, but it was showing the, the rise in both teen loneliness as well as teen suicides. Yep. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this has a point to what we're talking about. So just bear with me one second. Don't worry, I'm right there with you. Yeah, but this has been a very sharp increase. And that increase started with the launch of Facebook. You go back in time and say, okay, where did you know, Facebook launch? When did it go public? And right about the time that Facebook really started to gain traction with the population in the US, these suicide rates and teen loneliness rates, et cetera, uh, you know, shootings, et cetera, have all kind of accelerated. And, and, and the point is, is that we can trace back a lot of actions back to social media. We've raised an entire generation to have this dopamine addiction. And, you know, we need likes and we need, you know, we need people to retweet our stuff. And, you know, Adam looks at his, his views every day. How many people are viewing my videos? <laughs> and and, and I, I just, but it, it's that dopamine, right? And that's what we like that feeling, right? And it makes us feel good. And we've done this with the financial markets back in, you know, pre-1990, 
we actually invested money based on fundamentals. And the way you knew what was going on with the stock was you had to wait for the Wall Street Journal to get delivered to you. And you'd open it up and thumb to the back of the Wall Street Journal and, and look and see what the stock price did yesterday. Um, and, and so it was a very slow effect to try to get that information. So the average holding period for stocks in the 60s and 70s and 80s was about six years. Um, today, it's less than six months. And this is because we changed the whole market to this you know, this casino of flashing red and green lights. And it's this big driven dopamine effect that, oh, uh, look, that stock, it went up 100% yesterday. So I need to jump into it today. And I don't want to miss out. And, you know, we talked about Robinhood before, you know, they would, you'd buy a stock and we give confetti all over the screen. And, and so, you know, it's like, oh, I'm getting rewarded for buying stocks. Isn't it great? Uh, Robinhood's going 24 seven now trading. So you can now trade your brains out for 24 hours a day coming up here pretty soon. Yeah, it's the all day casino now. Yep. Yeah. And, but this is, we can, all of this attitude and the sentiment and things that have happened in the financial markets back to what occurred on, so, what occurs and, and is still occurring on social media. Uh, you know, all these meme stocks, the reason those meme stocks took off is why? Because people were on Reddit, on their app, on the phone, you know, whatever, what, reading Reddit and they going, oh, look, everybody's buying. You know, AMC, and I was writing articles saying, hey, this has happened before. You're not getting Wall Street by the tail. They're going to wind up winning in the end. And they mm. did um, and, and badly. Um, but this is just this is nothing new that is going on in the markets. There's nothing healthy about what's going on in the markets. And this is why it's important. And, and, and it's always and, and no offense to you, Adam. You know, I love you like a brother. And I think we, we, you know, we do our best job of, of giving people information they need. But if you want to be better at managing money, when you come into my office, there is no CNBC on, there is no Fox business on, there is, you know, there, there's no news channels on whatsoever. I do tweet in the morning at between 6.30 and 7. I put out my tweets for the day. I don't look at Twitter again for the rest of the day. Don't touch it until the next morning when I put up my next set of tweets. And that's just to give you all something to feed on. So, you know, but, <laughs> but during the day when I'm managing money, I look at data. That's all I look at. I don't look at news. I don't look at headlines. I don't read articles. None of that. Um, you know, so that's if you want to be a better investor, turn all that other crap off and focus on what matters. And that's the numbers and that's the technicals. Hey, let me let me ask you a question about that. Um, so I just interviewed Katie Stockton of yeah. Fairlead Strategies, and she's yeah. a technical analyst. Yep. And and I she's I don't, I don't know her personally, but I know who she is. Okay. Yeah. So she's uh you know, she's a very disciplined technical analyst where she basically says, yeah, sure. Like I read the, you know, I look at the fundamentals and I have an opinion on them, but she's like, in my day job, I don't, I don't think about it. Yep. I'm just about price action. Yep. Right. And um, it, it, fascinating interview. In fact, if folks, if you haven't watched it, it'd be a good one to watch after this video here. I'll, I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, but she basically just says, and to me, she is sort of like the purest essence of what you talk about of like just trading the markets you have, not trading the markets you think should exist. Right. And she's like, look, you know, if there's a turning point in the market, I'm going to let the market tell me that there's a turning point in the market. And yeah, I might, I might, you know, ride the beginning of the downturn, but but hopefully I get out pretty quickly once I see the technicals have turned. Yeah. If I get this sort of thesis that the market's going to turn and then I take a it, you know, I, I switch my allocation in advance, and then it doesn't happen. You know, I've I've kind of been deceived by all the noise, right? And so um, I don't know. It just it, as she was sort of talking, I was like, I bet Lance has got a pretty you know pretty interesting point of view on this because, you know, probably the right thing is some sort of marriage of the both, which I think you try to do a pretty good job of doing. Um, but she's just like Vulcan. Right. She's just like, look, I don't I don't let anything come in to influence my emotions. I'm just in my isolation chamber, just looking at price action. Yeah. You know, so for me, and, and I, I appreciate her work, too. She's she's very good at what she does. Um, for me, it's a little bit different. I can't run a purely technically driven portfolio. Um, I have constraints around turnover and other things like that. So, um, you know, because we're managing retirement capital for a lot of people. So you know, tax, you know, capital gains considerations are important and tax losses and all these type of things. So there's other factors that weigh on how we manage money. But, you know, we do have a very, a very strong technical component. You know, we talk about buy signals, sell signals, 
and we follow those very closely. And you know, we uh, you know reduce exposure in February. We increase exposure in March. We reduced it you know back in mid April. And you know, so as those signals occur, we're making portfolio adjustments. Um, but there's also some other factors that weigh on that to keep us from. But you know, because again, I can't have a portfolio that has 200% of your turnover, right? So if I was running a purely technical portfolio, I would just by its very nature of it being a technically driven model that it would have a lot more turnover that I just can't work with. So, so there is a, for us, and again, I'm not saying anybody, everybody manages money differently. So there's no right or wrong way to do this. We do it. Um, we, we have to apply this kind of fundamental overlay on top of our technicals to try to, to, to keep that balance in, in somewhat of a check. Right. Well, and, and the right way to do it is to deliver the best returns for your clients <laughs> over time. Right. <laughs> Try. Um, there's definitely long ways there's no, to do it. <laughs> right. And, and there's no guarantee of any of that, obviously. I mean, you know, we just do the best we can. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, you know, we're going to make wrong choices and uh, things that we think are going to happen aren't going to happen. And, you know, we go back and talked about MetaTrade last year. I bought Meta. We got stopped out of it on earnings day. I didn't I didn't get back into it in time. Big mistake. Socks up 100 percent since then. The fundamental story was right. The technicals tripped me up and I completely screwed up that trade. But that's just part of managing money. I'm a human. Um, and, and eventually when I get artificial intelligence to replace me, that'll stop happening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, look, when, uh, you know, you, you're super, what I love about these weekly series is they give you a chance to, to, you know, A, showcase what you're doing, B, talk about the wins and analyze the losses, right? And you're, you're, you're again, you're very good about putting your neck out to say, hey, look, you know, here's something that didn't go the way that I thought. But the reminder, as we sort of talked about is like, you know, it's, a 300 hitter, you know, in, in Major League Baseball, that's a great hitter, but that guy's missing, you know, seven uh, out of every 10, you know, pitches he gets, right? Um, or swings that he takes. So um, uh, uh, just on that that point, too, there was an interesting uh, stat that I heard the other day of um, uh, one of the most important things from a performance basis, not not just in finance, but in sort of all aspects of, of life um, in business is the ability to say no, right? Is is you, you, you spend the first part of your career really trying to hone your expertise to take advantage of the opportunities in front of you. Um, but then what tends to happen is, is, is then the world comes to you and wants you to participate in kind of everything because it wants to tap your expertise. One, you got to say no to that stuff to not get distracted, but also, um, you, uh, Stan Druckenmiller, and I, 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 I did a video yesterday with the New Harbor guys talking about a lot of the stuff that 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 Druckenmiller is kind of warning about right now. And he talks about the fact that he just doesn't see any fat pitches right now, and so he's sitting on his hands. And and that term fat pitches is is, is really important because it's a great example of how a great investor becomes and stays a great investor, which is they wait for the fat pitch and the the sort of background I heard about this is, is actually in Major League Baseball. Um, this ability to say no is super, it's like the number one um, factor that pitching coaches say, or batting coaches say makes a great batter, is there's a lot of pitches that are almost perfect, but they're not quite. And you as the batter have to resist swinging at them because your odds of hitting a not great shot are still possible. Yeah. Where it's just like, just wait for the perfect pitch. And if you can have the discipline to wait for the perfect pitch, your you know, potential success rate, your batting average generally tends to, to you know, dramatically increase, right? So this whole part of like just not getting distracted by everything, being willing to accept the strikes that aren't the perfect pitch so that you can then be prepared to go for the perfect pitch when it happens. Yep. Huge uh, analogy to investing, I imagine, right? Oh, yeah. Where you you, no. you got to say, look, I'm yeah, I'm going to have some losses. They're, 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 some are going to come, some are going to go. I just have to make sure I'm really good at the fat pitch when it comes my way. No, it's, it's funny because I'm writing about that this weekend's newsletter. Um, we're talking about the NFIB data that just came out, which is sending off numerous recessionary alerts, right? And so we're talking about being bearish again, right? So here's the market doing one thing, and then we've got more data out that says, you know, hey, there's a recession at hand. Um, you know, and so we can't ignore that data because that recession, that NFIB data is very important and has a very high correlation to market outcomes over term, over time, the type of thing. But I'm actually writing it. One, one of the things I write in the newsletter at the bottom is always write about, you know, this is how we're trading this right now. And I said, look, right now, we're 
underweight equities or overweight cash and bonds. And I'm willing to accept near-term underperformance. I don't like being underperforming. That's not my job. But I'm willing to accept some short-term underperformance in the market, not to have to be trying to make up a big decline in the market. Making up losses is a lot harder than making up opportunity, right? So mm-hmm. if, I, if I'm just underperforming and I avoid that big decline of 5 or 10%, whatever it is, I'm not talking about 30, I'm just talking about 5 or 10 if I can avoid that, then I've got a really good opportunity to buy things, put stuff in the portfolio, and then capture the next run in the markets, and I can make up that underperformance. But right now, and I agree with, with uh, Drunken Miller on this, is that outside of those five or 10 stocks, which are now grossly overbought, there's nothing really compelling in the markets right now that, that I want to go stick a bunch of money into. Okay. And that's a great segue into your recent trades. What, if anything, have you done? Uh, so this week, we... Uh, um, we had bought AMD and NVIDIA last year. We traded that. Both of those we sold between 50 and 100% gains on those. Um, we're still out of NVIDIA right now. We want to own that stock longer term because of the, of the rise of what is happening with artificial intelligence. They're going to be the big beneficiary of that uh, because of their GPUs and things that they make. Um, but we did uh, buy a starter position in AMD on Friday. I'm uh, sorry, not on Friday. Sorry, on Wednesday. We bought a starter position in AMD. So it's a very small position. It's a feeder position. Hopefully we can get a bit of a pullback in that stock over the next you know, couple of weeks. And so I can add more to it. Um, we also had owned Albemarle uh, for a long time, the world's largest lithium makers. And of course, batteries aren't going away anytime soon. And the more stuff that we were going to do requires more lithium. Though That eventually change because uh, lithium can't supply uh, the battery needs that we need. So ultimately, there's going to be a, a rise of a hydrogen battery or, or some other uh, type structure to uh, contain electricity. But for right now, we don't have an alternative. And Albemarle's had a huge correction last year. Uh, we made a lot of money with that one previously and on a, on a decent sized position. And we just started, uh, it's gotten very oversold. It's kind of trying to hold the support level here. So we started buying a little small starter position in that as well. And then, like I said earlier, we uh, um, moved our T flow position, which was our floating rate treasuries into shorter, a uh, little bit longer duration, uh, three to five year treasuries in our on our bond side. But that's all we've okay, done. Great. So very small so stuff. You, you mentioned just a few minutes ago when you were talking about the NFIB data that, that you, you, you maybe be becoming a little bit more bearish from here. Seems like most of your trades that you just did this week were all buys. Um, do you expect to do some sells in the future or right now are you just still buying? You know, it, it's, um, it's where you well, see value. Well, it just there, th- these two companies had, had gotten beaten up pretty well. Um, and technically, they're on you know, clicking off some early buy signals. Uh, but again, they're, they're still they're very small positions. So it didn't they don't move the needle much. I mean, if a 1% position, if they go down 10% in the portfolio, it's, it's a negligible move for the overall portfolio. Yeah, right. and, and I get that you're you're buying yeah. values that you're seeing emerge right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious: Are you looking at the rest of your portfolio? If indeed you're becoming a little bit more bearish and saying, "All right, what here looks like we should maybe start selling." Yeah, yeah. There's well, <laughs> well, depending on what happens right now, the market's doing fine. Uh, again, the market's not done anything wrong at this point, and it's and we've actually been consolidating in a tighter and tighter range of the market. So we're going to have a defining point over the next two months. This market's going to make a decision one way or the other. It's either going to break down and we're going to have a 5 to 10% correction or it's going to break to the upside and we're going to make a fairly, you know, probably a 5% move or so higher. I don't know which way it's going to be, but we're in that type of a range right now. So if the market begins to deteriorate, yes, we'll we'll probably take some profits and you know, we've got big runs and things like uh, Comcast and Apple and Microsoft and, and some of the other discretionary stocks in our portfolios. We'll probably take some money off the table with those if we need to raise some more cash. Okay. Well, that's pretty nice to be sitting on some big runs. Yeah. Um, all right there, Lance. Well, look, we'll, we'll uh, have to wrap it up here for the week. Uh, we're at the right time. <laughs> um, great conversation as usual. Uh, folks, just a reminder, um, Lance did a really good job of, of giving both the bull and the bear case and you know talking about how he's trying to navigate all that, but understand that that's generally very hard for the average investor to try to navigate. So if you're feeling confused, a little overwhelmed, daunted by how to you know protect your wealth through all this stuff, highly recommend that you work under the guidance of a professional financial advisor who takes into account all of the macro issues that Lance and I have been talking about here. If you have a good one, who's being a good guide for you, great, stick with them. But if not, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even Lance and his team there, 
at Real Investment Advisors. Just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com to fill out a free consultation with these guys. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. They just offer it as a, a public service to help as many people as possible get prudently positioned for, for what may lie ahead. Um, folks, if you've enjoyed uh, this week's discussion, would like to see uh, this weekly market recap continue in all of its glory. Uh, please do Lance and I a favor and support this channel by hitting the like button then clicking on the red subscribe button below. What well, was that little bell icon right next to it? And most importantly, folks, before you click away, please uh, go in the comment section and wish Lance a big happy birthday. Lance, I uh, hope you have a great one. Hope you have a great time this weekend. Uh, you definitely should be well celebrated. 58, look, dude, you don't look a day over 64. <laughs> exactly. The way I feel about it, too. <laughs> More like 73, I think. All right. But uh, but but have a great one. And, and, and thanks again just for your commitment to this show and all the time you put in and all the great uh, uh, insight and information and inside baseball that you share with everybody here. Um, have yourself a great weekend, buddy. See you next All right. And everybody else, thanks so much for watching.